please welcome our guest to the stage. Mick Garris, Alice Krieger. And Surika, who's going to, Dr. Surika, who's going to uh, present the Q&A. Please take a seat, there you go. Thank you, Simeon. Good evening. Will you please join me in thanking our two fantastic guests, please? Mick Garris and Alice Creek. Thank you. Hi, thank you for coming. I was telling these two that there's a 15 year old inside of me that is slightly screaming right now with joy <laughs> because of this momentous moment. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be a bit nerdy because it's my job to be nerdy and actually, um, give you a little brief rundown, should you have forgotten the amazing talent that's sitting next to me here. So to begin, and ladies always go first, Alice Creek, a fantastic actress from South Africa, trained and studied at the RSC, am I correct? Yes. Um, I have read that you particularly enjoy playing Miranda, if I'm remembering correctly, from Tantris, yes, yeah, from Tempest. Um, Notable for incredible roles in film um, and a very gothic lady, if you don't mind me saying it, it's a real compliment from me. Your roles, particularly embodying gothic femininity. I know my colleague Linny will be discussing this with you tomorrow <laughs> in great detail, but also really? known. I didn't know that. Oh, I think so. I think you embody this beautiful of the worldliness. Um, but certainly we know her from, as you know, Chariots of Fire, from Ghost Story. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Mick was, you were on Ghost Story as well. Doing publicity. Yeah. 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 They have yeah. an entwined life. It's quite amazing, actually. <laughs> we will get into this. Uh, Haunted Summer, where you played Mary Shelley. Oh, how lovely that you should know that. Ah, it's Thank actually you. in the current edition of Gothic Studies. I have a beautiful photograph of you at your writing desk. So oh, really? this is quite, quite something. Um, I'm going to get to Sleepwalkers, of course, but um, the Borg Queen, of course. <laughs> In Star Trek. Um, your career is illustrious. It is wonderful to see you here, to see you in your new film, which is coming out. I know we're going to be looking at that tomorrow, but we're going to go 30 years back in time and think about your amazing performance in Sleepwalkers today. That's okay. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to also introduce Mick Garris, the master of horror himself. Thank you. Ah, shucks. So modest. Mick started out in publicity with Embassy, if I'm not mistaken. Afco Embassy. Afco yeah. Embassy, yes. Um, I saw photographs of you, 1977, on the Oscars car red carpet with R2D2. 1978. 1978. Uh, um, I don't think you saw us together, but maybe you did. I saw, well, I saw photographs. I wasn't alive, yeah. but there you but go. But yeah, I, I, my first job in movies was answering phones for the original Star Wars and operating R2-D2 at personal appearances, including my one and only trip to the Oscars. <laughs> but what a year. What an, <laughs> it was yeah, pretty worth what it. an event. Yeah. Um, Mick has told me, which is just an amazing thing to be able to say this sentence, he has worked on five John Carpenter films. <laughs> That's pretty astonishing. Plus two Masters of Horror episodes Plus two that he, of horror. he directed. So yeah. um, you're obviously known very well for your own work, of course, in horror cinema. I mean, a personal favorite of mine would be The Stand, but obviously we have Sleepwalkers as well. We have Hocus Pocus. I know my colleague Linny really wanted to thank you for that. I assume her daughters were entirely <laughs> raised on Hocus Pocus, as many Good people's parenting. kids. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and just to add that, you know, you're, you're the Mr. Nice Guy of horror. And we, we really, it's a really great thing to have you here today. So I just wanted to welcome them formally from all of us, because I know we all appreciate that they've come this way to be here with us tonight. Thank you so much. It's it's really so great to to have work that you've done that has connected with people. And here we are, 30 years later, celebrating a movie that was critically drubbed but was financially successful. And so you're in the gutter with us, and it's nice to share. Yeah. <laughs> so I suppose my first question to kind of get us rolling on Sleepwalkers is, um, how did the project come about? It was Stephen King's first original screenplay, not based on one of his books or stories. Um, he had done some other things that had never been produced. He, he worked with Sam Peckinpah on a project that never happened. Um, and so 
I was called in. My agent set up a meeting with Columbia Studios to meet with them, and I had a great meeting. And they said, well, you've got the job, but we have a relationship with this other agent who represents this other director. And we have to do that just by rote, just out of respect. So they gave the job to the other director. And he started rewriting King. And if you've got a movie called Stephen King's Sleepwalkers, <laughs> really tough to release it with that title if it's not his script. He started writing about a planet of sleepwalkers uh, and all kinds of things that just went so far afield that um, that relationship apparently ended. So I got another call to come in and uh, meet oh, with this them. Sounds like Hollywood. <laughs> it? It's yeah. pure Hollywood. <laughs> so I, I, I took this uh, second meeting at the studio and uh, we had a nice lunch and it went really well, but what I didn't know is how well it went because they moved me into my production office to start pre-production that day. I had no idea I was getting the job, so that's how it happened. King, he had director approval. He had seen Psycho 4 and this television movie that this other unnamed director did. And so he was fine with either of those until the other one started rewriting him. And uh, so he, realized that there was a consistent theme in Psycho 4 and Sleepwalkers, don't tell my mother. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, she's passed away, so you can't. <laughs> but, but so there you have it. That's, that's how it came together. Okay, Alice, can I ask, how, what was your initial thoughts when you'd read the script when I'd gotten to you? Mick had seen you in Ghost Story, I understand, and was blown away by you. So. Do you remember reading the script? I met, this was a very long, I guess this was before most of you were born, right? <laughs> <laughs> so forgive me if I don't remember a whole lot of it. But Mick, did I kind of say that I wasn't, that I couldn't, didn't really understand the script? Because I can remember a meeting between you and me. Yeah. And after that meeting, I suddenly got that it was Stephen King, forgive me, taking the mick, yeah. right? Because <laughs> he was, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. And, and when I suddenly understood that was what it was, we were kind of away to the races, weren't we? Yeah. But it was that meeting that I had with you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember that you had read it and you met with us. You were the very first person I thought of for the part. Really? We met several other actresses, including I had a meeting with Bo Derek at the time, which was wow. so bizarre. Wow. Um, she didn't read, but <laughs> we met. Um, but once I saw Ghost Story, I was besotted with you and, oh, really? and oh, just okay. thought this is so, there's this combination of seductive eros and arist uh, aristocratic intelligence that was, they're usually at odds with one another, but in Alice, it just became this handshake of such beauty and power that really? I knew <laughs> that she would be the right person for this. And then when we had our first meeting, um, I, I let her realize that there was a sense of humor behind it, right. that it was operatic and it was um, Shakespearean and it was psychotic. Uh, and and she suddenly understood the underlying sense of humor that Stephen King and myself shared and that Alice has a wonderful sense of humor as well. Actually, after that meeting, I decided that I would do as close to a Shakespeare. It was, I decided she was a tragic heroine, actually. And if you think about it, she is. I mean, from her point of view. Yeah. So I decided I would do a female version of Coriolanus. Mm -hmm. And that's what it was. That I, and Oedipus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if I ever told you this, Mick, but I went and I bought about 40 yards of red cloth. I mean, red the color of the seats. Wow. And um, I had a very small room the size of a cupboard that I worked in and I wrapped the room in red. Oh. And that was where I learned my lines. Wow. Was in the red room. <laughs> <laughs> the sanguinary room, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, wow, just to think, just to think about it in, in that sense of, 
the, the color red and, and your association with that. I, I I remember seeing an interview with you where you talked about your fingernails. You wanted to go for a very particular. Yes, it was the, the the makeup. Finger. Yes person was this, is this wonderful guy. I've never seen him since. His name is John Blake. But he taught me so much that I take John Blake with me everywhere. Anyway, on the first day of shooting, I came in at 5.30 in the morning or whatever time it was. And I said to John, I think she's got to have red nails. Now, this is long for me, right? I usually am down to the quick. And John said, okay, we'll, we'll do red nails. So he painted my nails red and we were shooting on a very old stage, weren't yeah. we? Yeah. At, what, Columbia? Columbia stages, yeah. yeah. Um, so these stages are huge and they're seriously old, right? They're what, 80 years old at this yeah. point. Yeah. Um, we discovered that the nail polish didn't dry, right? So I had sticky nail polish all day. And by the end of the day, every piece of fluff and dust on that and stage cat and cat fur had stuck to my fingernails. So poor John Blake had to redo my nails every day that we shot. I came in half an hour early so John Blake could do my nails. Bless him. <laughs> well, they are beautiful throughout. I have, yeah, they really are. They are. So Mick, I wanted to ask you, so this is your first collaboration with Stephen King. Right. Uh, the two Stevens have been very good to you, both King and Spielberg. Yes. In your career. So I think this is amazing. This is your third feature film, if not. It was my, fir my first studio film. First my studio. second feature film as a director after the timeless classic Critters 2. So, well, I was counting uh, Critters 2, so yes. <laughs> That was said with sarcasm. You know. So that's what I was going to ask you. How, how what was different for you uh, as your first studio film? What was a lot more pressure? Yeah. Uh, it was even though it was a low budget for a studio picture, it was fifteen million dollars. Critters Two was a high budget for an indie at four million dollars, yeah. but much more demanding. There was a big cast. There was a lot of effects. There were children, dogs, puppets, cats. all of that. Now, in the case of Sleepwalkers, the oh, oh, cats the replaced yeah, the puppets. Yeah, 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 so yeah. they were more trouble, but very well behaved. Yeah. Uh, Clovis, in particular, played by the late Sparks, who was oh. a hero. Um, I assume he's late. It is 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't seen him yet. But... Um, there was a lot more pressure. It was Stephen King's Sleepwalkers, so there was going to be a lot of attention on the film. I had a line producer who worked for the studio who was constantly cracking the whip and telling me uh, he's going to pull the plug at 12 hours if I don't finish my days. And, and it ended up we, we delivered the film $300,000 under budget. So wow. I could have shot for several more days mm -hmm. and achieved more of what we were going for. But <clears throat> just because it was Stephen King and a studio film that was going to get a wide release, it was more pressure and more attention than I was used to getting. And uh, I just kind of buried my head in the making of the movie to not think about that part. Yeah. Wow. So that does sound like an awful lot of pressure, but yet still... Obviously, it had a creative power energy. I mean, I'm, you never hear films coming in 300,000 under budget. So. No, well, it wouldn't have if it had been up to me. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Then. Might have been over 300. But. I'm still impressed. That's still something. I was going to ask then, so th this film is notable for several things. One thing is, of course, it's amazing use of uh, very early adoption of ILM's morph technology. Yeah, we were the second morphing film ever made yeah. after Terminator 2 which they were, we were in production when that movie came out, so we had not seen any of their CGI work yet. And so our morphing technology was such that very complicated because you'd have to use motion control if you wanted to do a shot with a moving camera. Do you remember the motion control where the camera would move and repeat the move three times so you'd do it with the background, with the actor, with the actor in makeup, and all of that, and it was, they would give you an estimate of four hours, and then you multiply that by four, and then multiply that by another four, and that was more accurate. But um, it was very complicated, but really thrilling, 
because nobody'd really seen it before. The water weenie, uh, you know, in in uh, the in Cameron's underwater movie, um, but uh, it was really great because we had experts come in to do this stuff yeah. and fulfill a vision that we all shared. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was wonderful because rewatching it recently, you, I looked at it and went, oh my goodness. It, it really brought me back straight away to, to that time. It, brought, it made me think of black and white, obviously the Michael Jackson video. And, well, the people who did black and white were the people who, PDI, uh, which doesn't exist anymore, they're the ones who did Sleepwalkers. Yeah. Under the visual effects supervisor, Boyd Shermus was... Uh, was our, our chief on that stuff, and he was terrific. But it, it's really interesting. It's such a, it, it marks the moment so well in terms of that transition from, as you have a lot of complicated prosthetics there, but yeah. then you also have moving into that, that world that we exist in today, the CGI world, yeah. which is rather, you know, rather seamless. So it's a very important film in terms of documenting that. Oh, so. we're taking baby steps. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's what we need to do. The world is made up of baby steps in film every day. Yeah. Um, Alice, how did you find the when you did have to work with costume prosthetics, how did you find that experience as an actor? How, did, you, did you find it inhibited performance or did it help you unleash your inner feline nature? Uh, prosthetics at, at that particular time were, were particularly challenging mm -hmm. because of their immobility. Yeah. But um, you just work with what you have in the moment. Mm -hmm. And, and basically what matters is um, what's happening between me and me and, and the other actors. Um, it's actually am amazing that, that prosthetics are now so sophisticated, um, that they're so mobile um, compared to how they were then. Mm -hmm. But it was, n it was not an inhibition. It, it, it was what it was. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you were you were hopefully living inside the truth of the character, and that was what carried you through the prosthetic, mm -hmm. as it were. No, I agree with you. I think that it's very clear to me that your performance is very, it's driven by that emotion, by that sense of almost Shakespearean drama. The enormity of that is very evident in Mary, you know, in the character of Mary. Well, um, Alice is a very generous actor, and... And to be able to go through the three hours of makeups and things like that with no complaint and and seeing in the mirror and, and then having that reflected in your performance was something that not all actors are really capable of doing. And I've certainly worked with actors who would not have been saints like St. Alice here. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 d I really don't understand that because you, you're, you're task is to use everything that's given to you to 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 create the the, the universe of the story um so I, I i i don't understand why an actor would resist it um it doesn't make sense to me i have to ask you mick about the famous cameos <laughs> that occur in this <laughs> film um and i know you have said you know take out that shot, it wouldn't change the plot in any way. And you're right, but this film is special because of that cameo as well. It's a beautiful uh, flavor that runs through it. Well, that cameo uh, sequence was made for us. You know, the fans of the genre, the people who get it. Um, it wasn't for the critics, it wasn't for the mainstream, but when on opening night at the Chinese theater, it was packed with 1,200 people on Hollywood Boulevard. And when that scene starts, you hear, wait, isn't that Stephen King? Is that Clive Barker? Is that Toby Hooper? And it was thrilling for people who read Cine Fantastique and Fangoria to be able to recognize their heroes in this and King to be there, the writer of the piece, and to play a part of this hick. And, and he's, he was fabulous acting. Yeah, he right? Has he, does he act at all, or was, was this his... Maiden voyage and his only one. He acts often. <laughs> oh, does he? <laughs> Actually, if you've seen It Chapter Two, that's my favorite of his performances. Yeah, that's a He's so one. good in that. You, you would not think that's a writer playing an actor. Really? Uh, yeah, but it was so much fun because that scene was shot in two hours. King was available to us for two hours 
It's all done in one shot. We had so little time. That morning I went down, uh, I had my morning granola on the set, and you know this story. I, I cracked a molar and had to have oh. emergency dentistry on that morning. And I was please, we have to get this done before this time because Stephen King, Clyde Barker, and Toby Hooper are gonna be on my set. And uh, I went <laughs> to work with a copper crown, temporary crown, and, and did the job. And King was in for two hours. I'd never met him in person before. Oh my goodness, and, no. And uh, you know, we'd only known each other two by hours. fax and telephone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so two hours he was in and out, and, and Clive and Toby and King had never met, and he, King had made Clive's career with his quote, I have seen the future of horror, and his name is Clive Barker. Okay. And Toby and he had done The Mangler and done Salem's Lot, but not together. So it was this unbelievable reunion of my heroes. Or union. Uh, or union, <laughs> yes, it was a reunion. So uh, yeah, it was, it was a magical day. And it was shot in Franklin Canyon, which is just a few minutes from my house. So I, you know, I used to hike there and jog there all the time. So here was, we built a graveyard right near my home. So. And I had to talk to you about a particular scene. And you said to me, Come on this morning at this time because you'll meet Stephen. Yeah. And I got there and he was wrapped. He was done and dusted and I never got to meet him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, she did a great job regardless. <laughs> and King knows it too and has said so repeatedly. Okay, so then I just have to ask because it's a film that not only has fantastic cameos, a fant you all of course spot Mark Hamill. You recognized him behind the, the mustache at the beginning. Well, great. Um, but it's also got an incredible cast for the time but as well. But there's two more cameos. Well, that's true. Yeah. So we, we're going to name them all? John Landis and Joe Dante. Exactly. Yes, as the technicians, the lab technicians. And your lovely wife, Cynthia. She's in it yeah. as well. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it's, it's rammed with all the people you love. Not all of them, but most of them. <laughs> <laughs> From that time, I'll take it at that much. Um, <laughs> So I was going to ask you, what was I going to ask you? Oh, yes. Um, so we also have to talk a little bit about um, Machin Amick, obviously, from Twin Peaks. You remember her from uh, Shelley from Twin Peaks, a director in her own right now. Uh, and Brian Krause, of course, who uh, plays uh, the lovely Charles. So I was going to ask you about your relationship working working with them, how, uh, how you've got great chemistry on screen, not not only in the obvious sense, but also there's great there's great chemistry between yourself and, and Machin, I felt, in the scenes that you shared. So... That moment when you put the rose on her, I think is absolutely wonderful. I was just asking how you felt about your experience shooting together. Did you have any fond well, memories or any moments? They, that they were just lovely. They were just good actors being what good actors do, which is to be enormously generous. Um, because in the end, all you have is each other and Mick. <laughs> the script each other and make and and you have that moment and um it's wonderful when actors do what they did which is to be totally open and totally present in the moment um and they were wonderful and and the weird wild thing is that i've never seen either of them since isn't mm. that it's just the weirdest Life, I, I don't yeah. know how to explain it. Okay. You've seen them since, yeah. Yeah. but I, I never have. Yeah. And yet that moment, those scenes were absolutely intense, um, sort of loaded with emotion, freighted yes. with emotion. Um, and if they were here, it would be fabulous. It would, be it would just be so good to be in the same space yeah. as them again. Well, one of the things that needs to be said is that not everybody approaches a genre film with the respect that they would approach a drama or a Chariots of Fire. Um, but the commitment that Alice gave such an example for Brian and Machik, and Machen Amick to, to follow was that this was Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. It would, I wouldn't have directed it in any other way, maybe a little less playful if it were a pure drama, but their commitment to it as a movie rather than as a horror movie. Because a lot of actors do make that distinction and they do horror movie acting, which is 
a little over the top, it's broad, it's, it's disrespectful, um, which is why I hate the term elevated horror. But, um, you know... You're not alone, Mick. I can't stand that term either. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you're an academic. Mm -hmm. so. um, but the whole approach, and everybody got along so beautifully, yeah. and, and they're really lovely people, and I see Brian occasionally. I directed Machen in an episode of her series, The Witches of East End, just uh, several years ago. And it was like no time at all had passed. But the thing about casts and crews on a movie, you become so bonded and so close and it's so intimate and especially for actors because you are emotionally naked in front of the camera or uh, where there's 60 crew people and 10 other actors in a scene, um, that you really become close and intimate and you expect to be that way for the rest of your lives and then you'll go 20 years without seeing each other but when you do see each other again, there's this intimacy and bond that did not dissipate in any way in the 30 years. I haven't yeah. seen Alice in probably 15 years, and I just feel like my close friend is with me yeah. side by side right yeah. now. Yeah, it's very emotional. They, I, I, you know, there's this thing that people call actors lovies because they see each other and they fling their arms around each other. But it's just that it's... It's kind of dangerous when you walk onto a film set because you really don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if the scene's going to work. It's like stepping into a void. It's a gamble. Yeah. It's a tightrope. And, and the only safety net you have is each other. And so, like, when you see each other, other again after a 15 year absence. All of that just comes flooding back and you are right back where you left off. And it's a very precious thing. Yeah. It's, you've very gone through a happy war together. Yeah, it's a privileged and precious thing. I mean, you pay for it. You never <laughs> know if you're gonna do another movie, but the ones that you've done are there with you forever. Yeah. 30 years later being feted at a uh, festival like this one, yeah. For better or for worse, right? <laughs> no, just for better. <laughs> I'm going to open this up to the floor if there's any uh, questions. I can see one or two hands oh, here coming. Of... Oh, wow, okay. I really it usually can. takes a while. So while, the, um, while my lovely assistant, Simeon, in this case, uh, is going to get a, a microphone up to just the back row. I think there was a, a oh, hand sorry, up. Yeah, there That's okay. I will let you know. Do you know that Sleepwalkers is actually um, inadvertently kind of homaged in The Simpsons? No. Ah, I've got you all. Okay. Including so, me. Including you. So a treehouse, a treehouse of horror, uh, the third one. Uh, Lisa's cat, Snowball One, has died and they've decided to, well, they've accidentally resurrected a lot of zombies. And we discover that Snowball One died tragically, she tells us, because he was hit by the mayor's brother. Clovis. <laughs> so there you go. I found that at 7 a.m. this morning and was very impressed with myself. So there awesome. you go. There's a freebie for you. By the way, how many people had seen the movie before tonight? Oh, most oh, of you. A good, good part of you. Uh, About half of you. That's great. Thanks for coming back. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you so much for, for coming here tonight and spending time, you know, sharing uh, your memories of the film and everything. Um, my question was um this the soundtrack is really effective and is almost like a a character within itself especially um the Enya song and uh charles's favorite song as well uh was that a lengthy process in terms of deciding on those particular songs or, or the soundtrack as a as a whole did you play a role in in, in figuring that aspect of, of the soundtrack sort of thing yeah, I mean, the needle drops are one thing. Sleepwalk was uh, Santo and Johnny's tune that opens it up, Brian's song, uh, was what King named it after in the first place. <clears throat> so that was always a part of it. Do You Love Me, the dance routine in the theater lobby with Machen was in the script. But the Enya piece, there were a bunch of uh, CDs that were given to me to go through, to listen to, to choose the music, and originally, I knew Crowded House and was, and I asked them if they could do a song for the end. And I screened it for them and they gave me a song that was wonderful, 
but the studio wouldn't pay for it. It was a very paltry sum compared to what you normally pay. But um, so when we came across the Enya CD, nobody really knew her yet. Bodhisattva had not been released. It was not a hit yet. And we just thought this was such a beautiful, haunting way to go out. Nick Brown, uh, Nicholas Brown, our, our editor, and I uh, put it in. And it just worked so beautifully that I, my broken heart over not having my favorite band have a track in there was left out. But the same with the, um, uh, with the racing scene, the chase scene. That Well, I wanted this to be elevated, despite the negative aspects of that word, by the music. So we had a 60-piece orchestra done, uh, composed and conducted by Nicholas Pike, who had done Critters 2 for me. And I found out later that Steven Spielberg temped uh, movies he was working on with the score from Critters 2 that Nicholas had done. Um, and to have a 60-piece orchestra on the Sony stage doing this score, and all of the members of the orchestra, they're looking at the screen going, <laughs> what is this that we're scoring here? But, but it gives it such a heft and yeah. such a dramatic quality that usually it would be, you know, uh, electronic or synthesized instruments and all, but to have a full dramatic orchestral score really adds a whole lot of texture to this movie. That's a long answer, sorry. Another question. How many cats were there on the set? <laughs> and how do you get them to do what you want? I've got one and she does what she wants to do. <laughs> 126 plus there were um, nine Clovises. However, mm. Clovis number one did everything so well that seven of the Clovises were retired early. <laughs> uh, there was one mean Clovis, the one that hisses uh, at, the, at uh, Charles in the car. That was another one. Each of them had a specialty. One would be to be lovable. One would be to be on guard. They, they would all... They were all trained to do one specific thing. But Sparks, the cat who played Clovis, did all of these things except be mean. And in fact, when, you, when you're in the sheriff station and Andy is holding Clovis, he's stroking him, um, that purr is live. That was not added. You hear Clo Sparks going and just loving it. <laughs> so 126 plus nine is wow. the answer. How many Wranglers? Oh, how were they trained? Um, there, there was a great, there were probably five Wranglers altogether. They didn't always work at the same time. However, there's one really good trick to training cats. When the opening scene outside the house, when all the cats are outside and, and watching um, while the music is playing and the like, uh, well, no, it's later when they come, when they're all there they have little harnesses on that are stapled into the lawn. <laughs> so they were trained to do it. They were happy to do it. Um, it was not animal abuse. And as a vegan and uh, longtime animal rights supporter, I was there to make sure nothing was terrible with going on with the cats. But um, they were held in place. And you might try that. Put a harness and staple it into the ground. <laughs> Please do not try that. <laughs> And the one whose neck I snapped was dead before I snapped. I mean, it was a stuffed cat. <laughs> that had something built into it so that it would actually crack and break and be nasty. Sorry, I, um, I also have the cat-related question. <laughs> I always see Clovis as being like last cat standing kind of like Jones in, in Alien. Was that always an intention for him as, as a character? Well, the idea of the hero cat was certainly a big part of it. And I don't know if you've noticed, but King does a lot of cat stories where cats do not fare so well. Yeah. Um, and he's only had dogs. I don't think he's ever owned a cat. Um, but uh, Clovis is not the last cat standing. They're all heroes at the end that uh, to take their leave. So um, uh, he, he's the last hero standing. And he uh, comes to, to Machen's aid quite adeptly. But um, 
it's all the cats save the day. They they have matchstick fingernails, I guess, you know, claws that ignite when they scratch you. If you're a sleepwalker. Thank you. Just a, a, a quick question. Sorry, off cats for two minutes. Um, on the um, thank you with regard with regard the ratings boards in the states in the UK. Did you have any issue? with sequences filmed, I, I'm, I'm speaking more along the lines of the mother and son sequences, um, where they went to bed, basically. <laughs> let's, let's use that term, did that? Let me give you a big yes. A big yes, I can imagine. We had to go back to the MPAA five times to get an R rating. And if they hadn't accepted the fifth time, uh, they would not have allowed it to get a, a rating. Um, and the studio would not let me go to plead our case with the MPAA because they're used to hothead directors who would have ignited some sort of backlash. Um, but yes, there were uh, not just that bed scene, but also Andy when he gets shot uh, in the stomach um, out near the car. Uh, they made me cut the squib scene from that. I had to make five, nine different cuts and turn it in five different times. So what you see uh, is uh, a bit diluted, but maybe not in a bad way. But the point is, they're sleepwalkers. They're not you. So, I mean, it doesn't apply, does it? That's right. <laughs> Especially when they couple. <laughs> Hi, um, this is a question for Alice. Um, I don't know how many people I'm speaking for here, um, but I know my introduction to yourself as an actor, and specifically in horror, was your role in uh, the Silent Hill adaptation. And it was my first time viewing uh, Sleepwalkers tonight. And when you were talking about your, you know, you'd kind of played this role of the mother, this tragic role, like I noticed there were quite a few parallels between the two roles and this kind of, you know, tragic uh, person who believes everything that they're doing is totally right and justified. And I was just wondering if that was like a role that is that type of role that you tend to be drawn to, this kind of tragic matriarch almost? Um, I don't quite know how this works, but I don't go looking for them. <laughs> they find me <laughs> and I don't know what that is. Um, but uh, Christabella is the hardest thing I've ever had to do because it got way too dark, way too dark. Um, I wouldn't want to go there again. Um, Mary was a walk in the park by <laughs> comparison. <laughs> Now, you hadn't seen this for 30 years, so tell me what your, experience is, what your experience was tonight when you watched it. It's, it's very odd, because it <laughs> doesn't... That is a compliment. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it doesn't... I, I don't feel like that person at all. <laughs> I mean, anymore. I, I don't... I don't it's, this is very peculiar really I mean it's a the more you think about acting the weirder and odder and more peculiar it becomes so I don't think about it too much I just do it right but everything surrounding it you you had not seen it in 30 years everything surrounding your performance and the like was it what you expected or did you have any expectation? Do you know, I couldn't remember an awful lot of it. Uh -huh. And I I just thought, I thought Brian and Machen were lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Really. The scene with Machen <gasps> dancing in the foyer, wasn't that just charming? Yeah. Just lovely. My first uh, musical number. Really, yeah. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Um, and so many people have spoken to me about it over the years. I'd, I'd forgotten that it was funny. <laughs> I mean, I was sitting in the audience and, and the people on either side of me were, were kind of snorting with laughter. <laughs> and I felt as if we'd, we'd got it right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Can I ask a question just while we're getting somebody else? Can I ask, were you specially costumed? Did you have a, a, a specific costume designer assigned to you? Because your costumes, the way you're dressed in this film is quite stunning. We worked really hard at it. They were they really? were all made specifically for Mary and really quite deliberately. The fabric was chosen very, very carefully and the to cling and move. And to and cling and move, move. exactly. Um, it was a machine of it. Yeah. It was it was very deliberate. Yeah. And and just in case anyone is interested, um, the moment of choosing a costume, certainly for me as an actor, is an incredibly important moment mm. because it's the first concrete choice you actually make. Until then, it's all been kind of in your head and in your imagination, and that's the first time you kind of make an actual choice. Mm. Um, and and it was wonderful. What was the name of the costume designer? I knew you were going to ask. Sorry, no, I should remember. I should but, have a note down because I'm the she, one who said, "Oh my it word!" Was a, it was a lady, wasn't she? Yes. Yeah. And um, and she she literally fitted them to me, yeah. and we went together and chose the fabric, which was lovely of her. Um, it was a very very specific choice. Not accidental. Just we didn't get them off. We didn't get them off. You know, out off of a the shop. Yeah. No. You can yeah. tell it's tailored to you, but there's there's just there's particular moments when I just went. You look ethereal in some of those costumes, and it's quite. It, they're, they're so specifically made with your character, but also your body and mind. I'm thinking particularly of that moment when you break into the house and you're wearing this beautiful olive green dress, and with the red pop of your lips, you just look extraordinary there's in that a moment. That oh, that we yeah. Feel like. Yes, yeah. and and also to to play against the perception of what she was mm. was was very deliberate and quite specific. Excellent. Any other questions? I'm sure somebody. I've got one over here. Yeah. And another one over here. Excellent. Hi guys, thanks for being here. Um, just a quick question. You mentioned before that the um, movie was sort of critically panned. Um, I just want to know, you know, how you reacted to it at the time and are there any reviews that still, you know, keep you awake at night? Or any funny ones that, you know, you take some a certain amount of pride in? We just talked about this a little bit at dinner. Uh, about this movie, you know, if you pay attention to the good reviews, you have to pay attention to the bad ones as well. So if one is valid, then maybe the other is. But they also come from a place, at that time in particular, the mainstream press really hated horror movies. And something that was as rude as something that deals with sexuality and uh, interspecies mating. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Ours is a gutter genre, even though there's great work done within that. It was difficult for the mainstream, mainstream press to find something to like in it because it was not a movie star movie that was about heroes and villains that are easily demarcated. Um, but I don't remember specific reviews for this one, but one of my favorite bad reviews f specific to me um, was a review of Psycho 4. And I remember it because it was pretty fucking clever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The reviewer said, Director Garris is to Hitchcock what Peoria is to Paris. <laughs> Ow, but uh, pretty clever. <laughs> so I once had a similar review. No. I w yes, yes. I was in the worst production ever of Twelfth Night oh dear. at the Edinburgh Festival, and I was playing Celia. And the reviewer said... Alice Krieger flounces around like an over-anxious, surly temple. And he was quite right. I did. Nah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you remember the bad ones. There were good ones, not so much. Do we have another question here? Hi. Uh, this was my first time seeing the film, and I absolutely loved it, especially in this setting as well. Thank you. Um, so, 
uh, often like behind the scenes and uh, with like horror films in particular, um, there's a, like a lot of comedy and a lot of like levity behind like people like almost having to stifle laughs at certain scenes. And was there a lot of that in this film? Not so much. We actually took it very seriously as we were doing it. And the humor comes out of it organically more than it is forced. You know, Joe Dante is an expert at combining horror and and humor because it's very disarming. Hitchcock did the same thing too. He would try something amusing to throw you off guard and then cut your head off in the next scene. Um, so, but we committed to this. I made this as if we were making a Shakespeare play, I, taking it as seriously as any Oscar bait kind of movie that you would do. But, Oscar bait, yeah. what a great <laughs> phrase. That's so cool. To Oscar bait. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we all took it seriously, but we all had a really good time with it. And if something was going to be funny, whether it was Ron Perlman's performance or mm -hmm. his fingers getting bitten off and this really wide angle lens right in his face to exaggerate those things, the great thing about our genre is that we can do fanciful things with the camera and with the effects and with everything and help it tell the story and add a sense of, of playfulness and joy to it, um, even when we're covering the screen in red. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know, was, is Lee Hodgkinson here? I think he had, he sent a, a, a question in that he wanted to ask Mick in particular. You've got one? Oh yeah, I know you wanted to, I know he wants to ask Mick something, which is not totally related to this film, but about your career. Finally meeting you, yeah, there you go. Hi Mick, yeah, Facebook welcome to friends. Manchester. Thank you. And then enjoyed the film, it's the first time I've seen it. The, the cop death was a bit corny. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, with horror being really popular nowadays, would you think of bringing Masters of Horror back? The reason I would not bring back Masters of Horror is, at the time, I was working with managers who made themselves producers on the show, and they did some things that I didn't really appreciate, um, and including uh, making a, a deal with a, a network to do Masters of Science Fiction behind my back without telling me, which eventually I became credited with as uh, be, because it was spun off of Masters of Horror, but I had no involvement in it. And the Fear Itself uh, series was meant to be Masters of Horror 3, but it was done against my wishes. Um, so I would do another anthology, but it would not be called Masters of Horror because I don't want people who mistreated me and the other people involved to have any benefit from something special that we created that was not recreated um, with my involvement. So uh, it's a positive answer, but just not with the title. <laughs> so. I've been given the royal symbol, that symbol that we need to start winding up. So I'm just going to ask you both one small last question, if that's OK. Um, your current projects. What are we looking forward to? I know, Alice, we have your film tomorrow, but what else are you working on at the moment? If you can tell us, that would be great. Um, I'm producing two films. Great. Um, um, the, the one is um, based on, um, it's called Three Widows. Um, it's, it's kind of intense. It's straight drama. It's quite political. It's about three Jewish women, one Palestinian woman. Um, they all become widows during COVID. And it's the process of grief and loss and how that potentially opens you to a very compassionate response to others. And um, wait for it. Um, yeah, yes, I will be. I didn't think I was going to be, but I'm going to be. Um, it winds up in Palestine, um, essentially, in the end, about the loss and grief that's happening currently in Palestine. And the other one is a, is a, is a big budget movie, which is going to take some time. 
um, but it is based on the private diaries of um, a special cop in New York in the 80s. And it actually was the first undercover operation that that exposed human trafficking, oh, wow. um, particularly women. Wow. Um, I look forward to so it. So that's, that's yeah. me in a that nutshell. That sounds fantastic. Um, Clive Barker and I have just written a pilot together. We don't know if it's going to go forward or not. Um, we, it's at that stage where there are notes and discussions and all those things going on. But I also resuscitated a script, my favorite script I've ever written. Um, and uh, I rewrote it and brought it up to date. It's a, a period movie called Jimmy Miracle about evangelism in 1936 Middle America. And I rewrote it and freshened it and brought a new perspective to it, and it was set up immediately. Um, so it's in development now. And uh, a, a series that I've written, a two-hour pilot and 10-episode uh, outline from one of Stephen King's stories that is with a major TV star right now who wants to be a part of it. So all of them are maybes, but that's how life goes. We're going to keep our ears to the ground for that one. They <laughs> both sound fantastic. Everyone, would you please join me in thanking Alice Krieger, please, and Mick Garris. Thank you. Thank you.